Salute. Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Willis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I have been delegated this responsibility from my chairman, and his name is Ken Marsh. So at any rate, uh, if there is a problem with uh, the person that is now helping with this organization, talk to Ken Marsh. No problem. I will go ahead and introduce our program, and his name is... Ken Lawrence. Yes. <laughs> to give you just a little background on this guy, I can give you a three hour dissertation on that or a three minute or a 30 second. Which one you want? <laughs> so just to give you an idea here, Ken was born in Kingsport. He is a graduate of Dobbins Bennett and some other institution called University of Tennessee, and uh, Eastman retiree, former alderman for Kingsport, and a history buff, and involved in a lot of community endeavors, and he wants to give a unique perspective of early history and development here in Kingsport. And he is a railroad expert and that remains one of his pride and joy. <coughs> and member of the Kingsport Kiwanis Club, Presbyterian. His father was a city manager back in the 50s, correct? In the 60s, yep. 70s. So there are a lot of other attributes about Ken that I could go into, like I say, the three hour dissertation. But I know he wants to tell you about the history of the area, what he wants to review with you at this point. And yes, it has something to do with the railroad. I now give you Jim Marsh. <laughs> this is now yours. Well, it looks like you've mixed up all my notes, so we'll see what happens here. <laughs> David uh, talked about an expert. Uh, somebody told me one time that an expert is somebody that knows more and more about less and less. So <laughs> and you could be the judge of that in the next few minutes about whether you're dealing with an expert or something else here. I wasn't around at the time. Uh, Ray Willis probably was, but between 1890 in 1910, <laughs> there was a huge amount of capital flowing into Southwest Virginia, Southern West Virginia, Eastern Kentucky, into the mining business. And most of that money came from up east, but a big deal of it also came from England. Uh, in 1893, a company called Bering Brothers, which was a large international banking firm in London went bankrupt. And Middlesbrough, Kentucky was the great uh, victim of that bankruptcy because uh, the iron and steel and coal industry was financed in Middlesbrough by the English and it collapsed and, and Middlesbrough never came back. But moving forward from that, in 1899, <coughs> company headquartered in Big Stone Gap called Virginia Iron, Coal, and Coke Company went bankrupt. And the president of that company was George L. Carter. As an example of his life before then and after then, uh, he, by use of very capable lawyers, managed to extricate his capital in VIC and C out of the bankruptcy. And in 1900, he was unemployed, but blessed with the capital he had rescued through his lawyers from VIC and C. So at that point, he decided to build a project on his own. 
he would build a railroad to connect his coal tracks, which were extensive in Southwest Virginia and in Southern West Virginia, uh, to the Atlantic Ocean and to the Carolinas uh, to make a market, uh, to make a, a system, system that would allow him to move coal to market because coal in the ground has no value. It's coal where somebody needs it that it has value. One of the first things he did was he founded, he chartered a railroad called the South and Western Railroad. Now, that's not very definitive, but the South and Western Charter said that he was going to build a railroad from any place on the Atlantic Ocean to any place on the Great Lakes. That's pretty, pretty precise, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Anyway, in 1902, he chartered that railroad, and over a course of eight years, he had 14 different versions of South and Western. We had a Kentucky, a Tennessee, a North Carolina, the second one, the third one. It was a, a lawyer's a beautiful thing and a nightmare for anybody trying to trace the ownership. Anyway, one of the other things he did as soon as he chartered those railroads is he came, or actually sent representatives to what now is Kingsport and bought all the property from Churchill, basically where Holston Orders is now, all the way to Chestnut Ridge along the river. Several thousand acres. He formed it as a company called King Kingsport Farms Incorporated. And he held that property because when he built this railroad that he envisioned, uh, he needed a place that he could attract industries to use coal that his railroad could haul and it could haul whatever they made to wherever in the country it was needed. So as a result, in 1902, Kingsport Farms Incorporated was here and he got a fellow whose name was, was uh, Dobbins from Gillesville, Virginia, where he was from, to operate Kingsport Farms, which he did for many decades. <coughs> Between 1902 and 1904, Carter bought several little railroads, folded them into the South and Western, and built pieces of railroad that connected them together as a start. And he got the railroad completed from Johnson City through Spruce Pine to Alspaz, North Carolina, before he used up all of his capital and all of his borrowing power uh, to extend that. As a result, and this is unusual because Carter was a very reticent fella. He, he was almost the Howard Hughes of the 1920s, 10s, and 15s because he didn't say anything to anybody. He did all of his business through lawyers. He didn't, like, he didn't even like to see people. Uh, he had an office in Bristol and he lived on Solar Street and it's about five blocks from Solar Street to his office. And uh, he'd walk through the alleys to his office back just so he wouldn't run into anybody. <laughs> That's the way he was. But he was a visionary beyond belief for this area of the country. In any event, uh, he had to make a railroad to connect with the coal properties that he owned. He, he owned thousands of acres of coal deposits in Russell County, Virginia, Buchanan County, Virginia, and in Wise County, Virginia. So in economic terms, what he was trying to do was to make something valuable by using time and place utility. Whatever it is and however you get it. We'll come back to time and place utility. <laughs> so when he ran out of money, he went to New York, and nobody seems to know how he made this contact, but he found a company called Blair and Company, B-L-A-I-R, Blair and Company, which was a private bank in New York. The address was 24 Broad Street, which is right around the corner from the Stock Exchange. And James A. Blair was the president and the uh, chief officer of Blair and Company. 
But Blair and Company did business with some of the richest and most well-known people in the economic world of the United States. And through Blair and Company and these contacts, he invited key people to come to Bristol and to Big Stone Gap and to go over the properties that he owned or controlled and the idea of the railroad and uh, see if they would finance it. Well, they came and I don't have it here. This, this program came up kind of suddenly, so I didn't get my visuals together. But there's a picture of about 12 people on horses at uh, the Cranes Nest Coal Company, which is just above Coburn, Virginia, taken in January of 1905. And some of the people I'm going to be talking about are in that picture. But he came, he brought those people down, showed them the territory, and they agreed to finance the coal company, build the railroad, and market and develop the process of selling coal for a big profit over a railroad that would make another profit to the industries and to the population that would use uh, coal and enhance the wealth of all the parties participating. So that's where the story of the Clinchfield Railroad comes from. So after it was pretty defined where the railroad was going to go from and to, the South and Western didn't have the mystery it used to have, so they renamed it the Carolina Clinchfield in Ohio. That's kind of like the one end of the spectrum to the other end of the spectrum about doesn't say anything, it does say precisely what you're doing. Didn't get to Ohio, but they got to Clinchfield, the coal fields, and to Carolinas. These people who agreed, and we'll talk about them in some detail, to finance the coal company, which became Clinchfield Coal Corporation, later Clinchfield Coal Company, uh, owned over 300,000 acres of coal uh, properties, mineral rights, in the counties of Virginia. I mentioned Buchanan, Russell, and Wise. Uh, they formed a subsidiary as the Clinchfield, Carolina Clinchfield Ohio Railroad. And the third thing that these people owned was a controlling interest in the Seaboard Airline Railroad which ran from Richmond, Virginia, to Tampa, Florida, into Miami, a big operation. And the Seaboard Airline had no coal anywhere on its railroad, so it was perceived that that was going to be the link that the Clinchfield Railroad would be to coal for the Seaboard Airline Railroad. To <coughs> put that in a framework, the uh, uh, parties with Blair and Company called call, formed a company called the Cumberland Corporation. And it owned Clinchfield Coal Company, <coughs> the CCNO Railroad, and a controlling interest in the Seaboard Airline. So in 1905, they started building what became the most expensive railroad per mile of road ever built in the United States in constant dollars, the Clinchfield Railroad. The Clinchfield Railroad, railroads traditionally went around the mountains. The Clinchfield Railroad went through the mountains. Four, almost 4% 4 of the railroad was underground in tunnels. Uh, from Elkhorn City, Kentucky, which had an elevation of 795 feet, they crossed four summits to get to Spartanburg, South Carolina, 277 miles away, and it was Elkhorn, or Spartanburg, South Carolina was 20 feet lower than Elkhorn City, Kentucky. Now think about that. You know, you, Spartanburg's 200 miles from the Atlantic Ocean. Elkhorn City is what, 1,200 miles or 1,500 miles from the Gulf of Mexico. And yet they started from essentially the same level to go across the mountains. And the highest point of railroad was at uh, Altspass, North Carolina at uh, 2,685 feet. So they went from 800 feet to half a mile and back to 800 feet in building this railroad. The people who financed the railroad were the wealthy people of early 20th century America. I mean, really wealthy. 
they spared no expense to build the best railroad they could, uh, given the topography they had. Traditionally, railroads kind of cobbled things together and then went back over the next 50 and 60 years, fixed up the biggest uh, problems they had. Anyway, uh, the Clinch Railroad included over 10 miles of tunnels. It had a railroad grade, grade of course is the problem with railroads because the steeper the grade, the less you can haul. They built a railroad that had the, the, the target for grades was no more than six tenths of one percent. To give you an idea, a one percent grade on a hundred feet is one foot of elevation in a hundred feet. So here we're talking about a railroad that had less than a half a foot or slightly over a half a foot of elevation per mile as, as it went over all these mountains. Uh, that's not cheap. <laughs> Because of the topography they ran over, they weren't able to make it as straight as they wanted to be, and only 43% of the railroad of 277 miles was straight. 57% of it was in curves on one side or another. And Gray, Gray Tennessee is a great example. The railroad makes a complete horseshoe through the downtown area of Gray, Tennessee, not because the topography was tough, but they were making that 0.5%, 0.6% grade easy by making the railroad a little bit longer. The railroad was built with the most modern standards available in the first decade of the 20th century. It was built to haul, to handle 100 car coal, trains of coal uh, of 5,000 tons that would, would be 4,000 feet long. Now bear in mind, this is when they designed it in 1906. You know, we weren't very far past wood burning steam locomotives, you know, that uh, uh, were operating the railroads in, in the early 20th century. So, anyway, we can go into a whole lot of details, but as I say, it was the most expensive railroad ever built in constant dollars in the United States at one time. Just, just as one example, all of you, I'm sure, know where Rollinwood is, and probably most of you have driven up the road that goes up the North Fork of the Holston River right at the end of the bridge at Rollinwood. And you go under 11W and about another quarter mile up, there's a railroad bridge across the river, the Glacial Railroad. That bridge was built in 1908 to uh, Cooper 60 standards of construction, which were later revised as Cooper 72 standards. That bridge has never been changed in any way at all except having been painted. In contrast, at Rotherwood, in the same period of time, the uh, highway department, the state, the county, has built four bridges at the same place <laughs> because the standards keep going up and the bridges don't move. That's just an example. <clears throat> so anyway, one final comment about the railroad is uh, John D. Dennis, who we'll come back to, uh, was taken over the railroad in a special train in 1909 when they finished the construction from Dant, Virginia to Spartanburg. And uh, they asked him when he got to Spartanburg, they said, uh, Mr. Dennis says, what do you think of our railroad here? He said, well, the quote was, it will be splendid after you finish covering it over having just come through 10 miles of tunnels. <laughs> so that was his take on, on where all the money that he had been handling had come off. So who were the principals and managers of this project? And here is probably information that in, in maybe 80 or 90% of the information is something we've never heard before because we always drill down to John, to, to uh, Dennis and J. Fred Johnson at Kingsport. Johnson coach came along a little later. Anyway, the Blair and Company people uh, enlisted these wealthy Americans to finance the railroad. And this is the this is a portion of the board of directors for the first annual report of the Quinchville Railroad in 1910 and it's alphabetical, so 
and I'm going to skip some of them, but the first one was a man named C. Ledger Blair. He was the brother of James A. Blair and was a partner in Blair and Company. Not much known about him other than he worked the internal situations with Blair and Company. Second person, 1910, was George L. Carter. He, at this point, he is the president of the CCNO Railroad. He was a big time coal operator already, even though he had folded his coal ownership in Virginia into the Clinchfield Coal Corporation, he still held a huge tract of land in Coalwood, West Virginia, which was never involved with Clinchfield Coal Company. Uh, and as I said earlier, George O. Carter was a visionary. He, he dreamed up what would work economically for our region, and he actually made it come true through all these contacts. The next man on the list was Isaac T. Mann, M-A-N-N. -N. Anybody ever hear of Itman, West Virginia? Itman, I-T-M-A-N? Isaac T. Mann, Itman. <laughs> Itman was a banker originally, and he got into the coal business around Bramwell and Bluefield, West Virginia, and he got in big time deep financially, and finally he went to New York and sat down, I'm not sure how this happened, with J.P. Morgan. And he and J.P. Morgan agreed that man would be J.P. Morgan's man in the coal business, in the coke business in West Virginia. Now bear, bear in mind, J.P. Morgan was the U.S. Steel guy and the leading financier in America in the time we're talking about. So. He became a big time coal operator uh, with Pocahontas Fuel Company, with J.P. Morgan and U.S. Steel and his blanks. Uh, Mark W. Potter was the uh, CCNO president uh, right after George O. Carter, which happened in, during the year, the first year of the company. George O. Carter, again, was a reticent fella, and he didn't like to deal with all these people, so he resigned. He did stay on the board of directors but he resigned as the president and moved to Colwell, West, Col Col West Virginia very soon after he bought East Tennessee State Normal School for Johnson City. Yeah. Uh, next on the uh, list was Norman B. Ream, R-E-A-M. Anybody ever heard of him? Norman B. Ream was one of the 25 richest Americans in 1910. Uh, he was an officer and a manager in the Pullman Company of the sleeping car world. He was the president of Nabisco, National Biscuit Company. He was on the board of directors of Baltimore, Ohio, the Erie Railroad, the Seaboard Airline Railroad, and he was a key player in that panic of 1907. Now, the panic is a term that we used to call, well, they used to call panics, they're now called depressions. In 1907, the federal government got in big, big financial trouble, and J.P. Morgan and Norman B. Ream and two or three other people bailed the U.S. government out. It shows where the money's gone from then to now. You know, it's all in Washington, but then it was in these people's hands and managed to avoid a default by the federal government. Um, he, uh, where am I? No. he also uh, was the uh, owner of the New York Transit Authority and uh, was also in, in the insurance business, so that's where he made his money. Next fellow was W.M. Ritter. Now, W.M. Ritter was the leading hardwood lumber manufacturer in the United States. Based, based in Columbus, Ohio. And Ritter operated uh, all through the mountains of the south because that's where the hardwood was. Uh, for example, he had a, a, a sawmill in Hampton, Tennessee. He had one in Fremont, Virginia. He had another one in Clinchco, Virginia. It was really a great thing for him to 
to be on the board of directors of the Clinchfield Railroad because it ran through all this virgin timber across the mountains between South Carolina and Kentucky, and he he cut or contracted people to cut for a lot of that timber, including a lot for Eastman. Uh, Georgia or, or Ritter became the Georgia Pacific Company, which is one of the main timber companies 30 or 40 years ago. Thomas Fortune Ryan, another one you probably haven't heard of, but Fortune was indeed the important name there. Thomas Fortune Ryan in 1912 was <clears throat> categorized as the 10th richest man in the United States. Uh, he founded the British American Tobacco Company with the Duke family, R.J. Reynolds and so forth. Uh, he uh, was a key stockholder in the Seymour Airline. You notice I've already mentioned them in some other places. These people all operated together. It was a kind of a kind of a fraternity, you might say. Uh, anyway, uh, Fort Thomas Fortune Ryan at one time was said to actually have controlling ownership of 30 major corporations in the United States, one of which was the Consolidated Edison Company in Chicago. Uh, and finally, I, 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 next in is a fellow named Frank A. Vanderlip. I never heard of him until I started looking at him. He was the president of National City Bank in New York which is now Citibank, which is one of the big five banking companies in, in the United States, maybe the world. Uh, and he was part of the team that drew up the paperwork that was eventually passed uh, establishing the Federal Reserve. We hear a lot about the Federal Reserve now. Here's, here's one of the guys who had a hand in getting it started in 1913. And finally, there was a fellow named E.F. Watson, E.F. Watson was a what I would call a country lawyer in Spruce Pine, North Carolina. But the way he got on the board or got, uh, got recognition is in 1905 when Carter first got these people together to build the Clinchfield Railroad, the Southern Railroad, in an effort to keep the railroad from being built, decided that they would build a railroad from Johnson City to uh, Spartanburg, South Carolina, to preclude the Clinchfield from being able to do that. Hmm. So they started at Embryville. The railroad actually ended at Embryville, and they founded the Johnson City Southern Railroad and started building, actually grading and blasting and getting right away to the Johnson City Southern. Well, this guy uh, in Spruce Pine, uh, Mr. Watson, took the, rail the Clinchfield Railroad side of the case and carried it through the Supreme Court of North Carolina and got the Johnson City Southern buried so the Clinchfield could be built. So uh, apparently he was the local local attorney for the railroad for whatever else came along. By the way, <clears throat> there, were, there were three big lawsuits building the railroad. Well, Joe Carter had to defeat the Chesapeake, Ohio Railroad in order to use the brakes and the big sandy on the Virginia, Kentucky line. He had to beat the Southern Railroad on, on this situation, and he had to beat his old company, VICNC, on the Virginia and Southwestern Railroad, which tried to build a railroad from Clinchport up the river to uh, Colbert and Thomas Creek, which would again have been a, a conflict with where the Clinchfield was going to go. So just, just one one short thing about the executive officers of the Clinchfield Railroad. <coughs> Mark W. Potter, who was the second president, eventually resigned and was succeeded by John B. Dennis, but Mark W. Potter was appointed to the Interstate Commerce Commission in 1920. And the Interstate Commerce Commission was one of the early uh, regulatory agencies in the economy in the United States and was a powerful, powerful factor. And he, Potter was well connected politically and he became an Interstate Commerce Commissioner in 1920. Uh, the vice president and general manager of the railroad was a man named uh, M.J. Caples, C-A-P-L-E-S. Caples was hired in 1905 by this group of, of financiers 
and Cables had been a mining engineer in South America and, and been a railroad design engineer in the United States and was working at the time for the Norfolk Western <coughs> Railroad Bluefield. And it's Pat Cables who gets credit for designing the railroad to the standards that it still has today and it's still so effective in moving lots of material at a very low cost. He uh, resigned in 1912 uh, because, as J. Fred Johnson said in a letter I have a copy of, uh, he had aspirations to be a much greater railroad man than president of the Clinchfield Railroad. It didn't work out too well, and uh, he killed himself in 1932 in a hotel in Camden, New Jersey. And finally, the vice president of uh, traffic and transportation was a guy named J.J. Campion. C-A-M-P-I-O-N. And he's the guy who took the information uh, that came in the, to the railroad through these board directors people and through the, the Blair and Company people and through other folks like George Eastman and converted those ideas into business, into plants on the Quinchfield Railroad. He was the Blair and Company, uh, I guess the, you'd say he's the Blair and Company guy who kind of put it all together from all these pieces that came around. <clears throat> Here again, we go back to time and place utility, and in, in a moment you'll see why this statement that I'm going to make had become true. It's, we talked about time and place utility. Well, the place was coal. It's down here in the ground in Virginia. And the time was the time to get that coal to the market, from the Carolinas, to the ocean, to Georgia, even into Florida. Uh, it, uh, where am I, oh yeah. It, 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 the time and place utility of the railroad soon became what was widely known in the railroad business and in business generally as a little gold mine because the, the construction of the railroad was so good that they could outhaul anybody. An example, I've got a copy of a letter uh, where somebody was trying to buy 10,000 tons of coal for a ship in Charleston. The railroad had an export terminal in Charleston right under the big bridge across the Cooper River uh, called uh, Drum Island. The railroad, the railroad still owns that property. Anyway, uh, this guy's trying to figure out how many trains it's going to take to haul 10,000 tons of coal to Charleston. Uh, the, the, the Southern Railroad, which was a competitor, uh, wrote back that it was going to take five trains. Uh, they ran down through Bulls Gap, through Deep City, Bulls Gap, Asheville, down Saluda Mountain, which is the steepest railroad grade in the United States, uh, uh, through Spartanburg, Columbia, to Charleston. They said it's going to take five trains. Clinchfield came back and said, if you can get it all together, we'll take you down there in one. That's the kind of railroad that was built in the kind of country that the Southern ran through with an archaic design and what the Clinchfield ran through with good engineering and a major investment. <clears throat> okay, after, after the Great War, it shows how Ray and I are dated here after the Great War. Uh, Blair and Company, strangely enough, decided to dissolve the company. You know, they didn't sell it or give it to the grandchildren or whatever else you do with families. They decided to dissolve it. So then they got the Cumberland Corporation with this coal company, this railroad, railroad stocks, and other investments. They got to do something with. So. They decided they'd sell the Clinchfield Railroad. Well, uh, Mark Potter is on the board of the uh, Interstate Commerce Commission who has to approve that. Uh, he goes to the Interstate Commerce Commission and they refuse to allow Blair and Company to sell the railroad because it would be anti-competitive to the connections. Even though they had this, this long-term connection with the Seaboard Airline that we've already talked about. So, in desperation, I say desperation, that's not the right word, as a result of them not being able to sell the railroad, Blair and Company 
entered into a contract with the Atlantic Coastline Railroad, ran from Richmond all through Florida, and the Louisville and Nashville Railroad that ran from Cincinnati to uh, Pensacola, New Orleans, Atlanta, two, the two of the three big railroads in the Southeast, they decided and agreed, and everybody signed on to it, to le lease the Clinchfield Railroad to those two railroads for not nine, not 99, they leased that railroad for 999 years in gold for 5% of the face value of, of the stock, of each share of the stock, for 999 years. So, and I keep using the term Clinchfield, the railroad was actually the Carolina Clinchfield, Ohio, but after 1925, that company still continued on, but it was called the Clinchfield because the Clinchfield was actually the Atlantic Coastline and Illinois Railroad running running the show as, as the lessee of the railroad. Uh, just as a footnote, uh, John B. Dennis was the financial manager of all these enterprises through Blair and Company and all these people that we talked about who had money in this process. Uh, he was president of the railroad uh, after Mark W. Potter, but in 1916, the Cumberland Corporation, which owned these three entities, was separated into three individual situations. The Cumberland Corporation was dissolved. So John B. Dennis, uh, after 1925, he continued to operate uh, with Blair and Company as parts of these companies. But in 1925, when they leased the railroad, John B. Dennis came to Kingsport, bought Rollerwood, and managed his personal uh, uh, economic interests and operated through Kingsport Improvement Company to handle the land that Kingsport Farms Incorporated had not sold already through the railroad, uh, which is a lot of things about the land there, Jeff Fleming will probably talk about next month because much of the land that Kingsport's built on was all, always Kingsport Farms until after 1909. Anyway, John G. Dennis uh, lived here until he died in 1947. <clears throat> okay, well, what were, the, what were the results of the railroad as far as Kingsport's concerned? Between 1909, the railroad actually built the tracks through Kingsport and finished the tracks uh, between Johnson City and Dant in February of 1909 when they finished the bridge across the South Fork of the Holster River right next to Eastman. You know, where John B. Dennis goes over the railroad, there's a railroad tunnel. Well, that tunnel comes right out on a bridge about as far as me to uh, Jack here on the, another bridge of bridge like the one in Hollywood. That's when the railroad was finished, 1909. And in 1909, there was nothing down on the banks of the Holston River in Kingsport except fields and forests. Right here is the first annual report, so extracts of the first annual report of the CCO Railroad, dated uh, uh, June 1910. The uh, railroad in that first year handled 800,000 tons of coal. That sounds like a lot, but in the development of time, 800,000 tons is nothing. Uh, it also handled 180,000 tons of everything else. They call it merchandise, but we've been sand and gravel and plows and mule. Uh, collars and whatever. That just shows you where we are. So, so uh, they had less than a million tons of business the first year because there wasn't anything here to create any business except the development of the timber industry with WM River. In a list of new industries that year, there's only two entries. One is they located Kingsport Brick Company. That became General Shape. That's where the Jeff and, and uh, his Pat Joel and others are now going to build a, a Taj Mahal there of wonderful places to live. Uh, and the other one was Clinchfield Portland Cement Company. 
which was really the first industry in Kingsport. There were 30, 34 new industries on the railroad that year. Two of them were in Kingsport. 24 of those 34 were sawmills. One of which, believe it or not, was an exchange place right across the street from where I live. There was a tram railroad that ran from John B. Dennis, where it goes over the railroad in Eastman, out to exchange place, and there was a sawmill there. Track built that year, they only built two pieces of track connected with Kingsport. One was, was uh, for the Clinchfield Portland Cement Plant right here in Kingsport, and the other one was for the quarry for Clinchfield Portland Cement, where they got their limestone at Spears Ferry, Virginia. And that quarry is still there. It's not operating right now, but they operated it, then they moved down to Gate City, then they moved back to Spears Ferry, and then somebody else operated it, but it's, it's not there anymore. Anyway, the first year of the railroad actually operating, Kingsport was not much of a factor. One other note, additions and betterments. A new station has been built at Kingsport, Tennessee. Well, the new station replaced a boxcar, which was about the size of a Chevy Suburban uh, that was up on Timbers at the head of Broad Street. And they built this depot, which was about the size of a half of a double wide. And uh, that was the real first physical station in Kingsport. Then they built a bigger station, which is where the freight station, the, the, the distillery and so forth is on Main Street. Uh, and it burned uh, right to the ground. And it was a much bigger building. And so in 1917, the principals of the railroad uh, allocated $25,000 to build what is now the depot where Citizens Bank is. The brick, uh, architecturally desirable structure. It's, it's the only architectural monument on the railroad. No, they didn't do that anywhere else but Kingsport. They, they put $25,000 in it, and the Kingsport Improvement Company, i.e. John B. Dennis's other businesses, put $11,000 or $7,000 in it, and they built that people for $32,000. Still there, clock and all. <laughs> so anyway, not much was happening in 1910 for Kingsport, but time is coming. This is the sixth annual report for 1916. New businesses, Olson Lumber Company, Federal Dye Stuffs and Chemical Company, Kingsport Pulp Company, Kingsport Extract Company. I, I always wonder what extract was. I didn't know what they, that, that's a tannery. They're extracting uh, horse, bottles of what they call, something called Kingsport Lime Company, which means hydrated lime. Those are 1916 editions. Uh, now bear in mind, the Great War, it had been raging in Europe since 1914, and the United States was not in it, even in 1916, but the economic effect of the war in Europe was washing over everything. And here on the tracks, to kind of give you an idea of, of the impact here, there are 12 entries for tracks being built in Kingsport. Three of them are for the Kingsport Extract Company. And bear in mind, the building, the Kingsport Press, which is right across the street, was in, in 1924, was started as a factory to build uh, harnesses and leather goods for the military for World War I. That shows how far we've come here. Uh, anyway, three tracks were there. Five tracks were for federal dust and chemical, and that some of the old timers might remember, but where Wilcox Drive goes under the railroad, um, uh, where the credit union office is, the corner of that intersection, Wilcox Drive and Lincoln Street, where the credit union is, on both sides of Wilcox Drive, all the way out to Holston Ordnance, was federal dye stuffs. And there were all kinds of buildings in there and all kinds of railroad tracks. And in the next year, 1917, Edgewood Arsenal was built 
right in the middle where the parking lot for the original Eastman building and and the uh, the uh, auditorium is now. It was a big round brick building. Uh, uh, Calvin Sneed says he used to play the, and that is a young fella. That's that was there to fill gas shells for the military. And gas was not what you smell at the surface. In any event. Uh, all those businesses were coming to Kings Point in 1916. More came in 1917 uh, and in 1918. But interestingly enough, even in those in 1916, there was only one coal company mentioned as, as being added. And the reason for that was the Clinchfield Railroad was there to serve Clinchfield, uh, uh, the, co the, the coal company. And they didn't need any other business. They, they had about eight mines in the Dant, Wildwood, Virginia, Wilder area, and they were hauling coal just for the for the Clinchfield Coal Company. In 1918, there was a skyrocketing amount of new business and a lot of new coal companies, because apparently the demand for coal outstripped Clinchfield Coal Company's ability to uh, supply that. Well. In 1925, what was magic about 1925? Am I getting, am I getting to anybody? 1925 is when the railroads leased, where, where the management of the railroad and the financial support of the railroad evaporated. That uh, 800,000 tons or 900,000 tons of business in 1910 they grown to seven million, seven million tons of traffic by then, and most of it was still coal, but, but miscellaneous traffic, everything but coal, had to come up to where about 40% of the business was everything but coal. Well, in 1912, the merchandise traffic had grown to 13 times what it was the first year of the, of the company. In track built in 1925, bear in mind, the people who designed the railroad, financed the railroad, had taken a whole lot of value uh, out of the railroad and the value of the stock and the dividend and so forth. There was only one entry for Kingsport in 1925. And it was for a, a, a siding of about 300 feet right up here, one block up. 1925, that's when the press really got going from being a horse collar business. Uh, there were 17 other editions of track for industries, but only one in the, on the whole 277 miles was the Kingsport Press. So, so that shows you what the difference in people who are all in with their money and their, their ideas and their uh, vision do or can do versus a remote operation like a lease with a company that's in Wilmington, North Carolina and Louisville, Kentucky. In 1925, if you bear in mind, February of 1909, there was nothing along the railroad between Lovedale, which is where the, where the riverfront market area is, and the tunnel uh, under John B. Dennis at uh, Eastman, it was nothing along the railroad in that two mile, three miles uh, it, it, uh, economic situation except farms. In 1925, if you started Lovedale, on the river side of the railroad was a continuous series of factories, Clinchfield Coal Company, uh, Portland, Clinchfield Portland Cement, Kingsport Brick Company, General Shale, Federal Dye Works, Edgewood Arsenal, Blue Ridge Glass, the, the American Wood Reduction Company. Uh, then there was a little gap uh, from Eastman Road to where the tunnel is on the railroad. On the other side of the railroad, uh, starting again at Lovedale, you had what became Mead. You had Kingsport Tannery, which was still uh, there in the, in the shadow of itself. 
Uh, you had Keyswood Press, Austin Mills, Citizen Supply, which is a major <coughs> a building supply situation, Kingsport Foundry, and Wood <coughs> Mills. You know, from nothing but a cow pasture, that ain't bad in 15 years. Not bad at all. Again, shows you what committed people can do with capital and good ideas. So, what I'm saying to you is the railroad uh, was a monumental development with a huge amount of capital invested in it and with an incredibly beneficial return. The Clinchfield Railroad, for most of its life, had the lowest operating ratio of any railroad in the United States. They used to publish that once a month in Railway Age. Uh, and I used to watch that. The, the Clinchfield Railroad, the, the operating ratio of something like the New York Central uh, Railroad would be something like uh, 79 or 80 or 81, the Pennsylvania Railroad, something like that. Southern Railroad might have been 85. Clinchfield Railroad would be 55, 59. Sometimes it got up to 61, 62. What that is, is how much money it costs to produce the service that they got their revenue for without the debt payment and without, uh, I think it was, only, it was, it was one of the debt and something else. Anyway, and the Clinchfield Railroad, because of its standards of construction, was able to operate way under the uh, level of just about everybody else. And so these people who had the stock in the railroad really got, got well uh, until it was eventually dissolved. So, bottom line, when Blair and Company leased the CCO in 1925, no new industry of consequence came to Kingsport since then, except Holston Ordnance, which got here in a strange uh, turn of events with the, the War Department. So a profitable motive, an insightful plan, and a network of key people with ample capital can really create economic miracles. And here we are in the midst of an economic miracle. Since 1925, Kingsport has done its steady development locally and internally, rather than looking to New York and visionaries like George L. Carter and other people. Uh, so here we are down the road, uh, 112, 13 years from February of 1909 when there was nothing here but a cow pasture. So thank you for your attention. Well, Ken, once again, you have really, really brought a great program to us. And especially to me, because I used to think that, used to think, can you imagine, David, thinking? But history and music were the two pillars of where we are in this region. Now, what Ken has brought to us, and students need to know this in my estimation, but has brought science to us also. So we have three pillars. So Ken, thank you very, very much for a great program. Anybody have any questions? Any comments? We are now adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you.